It's good to be with you, church. My name is Halim I serve as one of the pastors and elders here at the Stone. We're in a series called Fathom in the Gospel of Matthew, where we're looking at the miracles of Jesus together. Many times we read about, hear about something incredible that's happened, and we say something like, I can't fathom that. I don't know how you feel about the miracles of Jesus. Jesus healing every sickness, every disease. You know, that's, a, that's a phrase that Matthew uses, that the crowds came to him, and Jesus healed every sickness, every disease. Jesus opening the eyes of the blind and people saying, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. That's, things like this has never happened throughout the history of mankind, and yet Jesus shows up on the scene and he does these incredible, incredible things. What do you think about that? Do you believe Jesus healed a blind man? Can you fathom it? Today in Matthew chapter 8, we're going to see Jesus not only heal sickness and disease, but even command wind and the waves to obey him. And if you want to get crazier, next week we're going to see Jesus cast out demons. We're going to see how Jesus halts and gets rid of demonic activity amongst the people in a place. What do you think about that? Do you believe Jesus did those things? Can you fathom it? And if he did it back then, do you believe he does these things today? The purpose of this series is so that we can fathom together the wonders of Jesus. Jesus not only came to declare the kingdom of God with his word, with his authoritative teaching, but he came to demonstrate, to show the kingdom of God with his power, with his might, with his wonder. As a church, we have a bent towards one way or another, right? Some of us have a bent towards Loving his teaching, loving his word, loving his wisdom, but we're so very suspicious about the miraculous and, and power and all these wonders. And others of us, we love the big, loud, flashy displays of power and miracles, but we don't bow down and submit to the authoritative teaching of God's word. The kingdom of heaven doesn't just consist in word, but in power. Our King Jesus, he is the Lord of both word and wonder. He's both, and we need to be a church that clings to both. Because I don't know about you, but I want us to be a church that not only says that Jesus did those things back then, right? Many of us, we say Jesus did those things back then, but I want us to be a church that says Jesus does those things today. Not just he can do these things today, but he does those things today. How do we know? Because we've seen it, because we've experienced it with our own eyes, right? I want us to be a church that says, Jesus, we, we want you to do these things today. And we ask you to do these things today. We're going to ask you, and we're going to ask you regularly to perform your wonders among us. Yes, give us your word, but don't hold back your wonder. A church that with great faith, faith says, do it again, Lord. You did it then, do it again, Lord. Let it not be said of us that he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Let that not be said of us, that we did not have because we did not ask. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 8, 23 through 27 today. We're going to look at the wonder of Jesus calming a storm. Some of you are going through something right now that can be only be described as a storm. As we look at this text together, as we fathom together Jesus calming the storm, let's be asking him to do it again, Lord. Do it again. Matthew 8, verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Jesus has been ministering to great crowds, right? Healing every sickness, every disease. And now he and his disciples are retreating from the crowds. They're traveling across the Sea of Galilee. And it says that here they encounter a great storm. 
A storm on the Sea of Galilee wasn't anything new. The cold upper air from Mount Hermon, which was about 30 miles away, mixing with the warm lower air of the Sea of Galilee regularly produced violent storms. And especially with many of Jesus' disciples being fishermen, right? Facing storms on the Sea of Galilee was just a normal part of life. But the storm that they faced on this day was something different. The Greek word that Matthew uses to describe the storm is the word seismos. Seismos, which means a shaking or a quaking. It's a word that's ordinarily used to describe an earthquake. This earthquake of a storm had Jesus' disciples panicking, fearing that they're going to die. And Matthew tells us that the boat was being swamped by the waves, wave after wave crashing in. And remember, these are veteran expert sailors. They grew up on this lake. On many days, I'm sure they spent more, out, more hours out on the water than, the, than they did on the land, right? And so I'm sure they didn't immediately panic. I'm sure they tried a few things out of their expertise, but a storm is a storm when you're at the end of yourself. A storm is a storm when you're at the end of your expertise and competencies and you are entirely overrun and you just don't know what else to do. That's the kind of storm they were in and they were at the end of themselves and so they cried out to Jesus, save us Lord, we are perishing. And the Gospel of Mark recording the same story records something very critical for us, Mark 4. 37, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? There's a great storm, and the disciples are crying out to Jesus, Jesus, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And so let's walk through the storm together. First, what is this storm that the disciples faced and what are the storms that we face in our lives today? What is this storm? Well, the disciples were facing a literal storm, right? But what the storms caused them to question is what's critical. The storm came upon the disciples and what did they cry? They cried, teacher, do you not care? Teacher, do you not care? that we are perishing. That's the essence of all the storms that we face in our lives. A storm for us is anything and everything that causes us to question, Jesus, don't you care? Jesus, don't you care that I'm going through this? Jesus, don't you care that I'm drowning here? Strictly speaking, this is the story of two storms, not one. There's one on the surface of the waters to be sure, but there's another storm in the hearts of Jesus' disciples, an internal storm of the heart, a quaking, a shaking, a seismos of the heart that's making his disciples question Jesus' care for them. And that's the more dangerous storm. That's the storm that could truly make them perish. And so maybe you're going through it right now. Everything seems to be going wrong. You feel like you're sinking. You're at the end of yourself. And God seems to be absent at worst and asleep at best. The storms that we face may be an unexpected shocking confession by your spouse. A storm could be a sickness, a devastating diagnosis. It could be a loss of a job. It could be a tragic accident. While for others of us, your storm may be just a general sense of numbness a darkness that just won't lift, a gloom in your soul that you just can't shake. A storm could be a loneliness that you physically feel right here in your sternum, or a storm could be an ever-present anxiety that causes you to be paralyzed with worry, with fears. A storm is anything and everything that causes us to question, God, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm dying here? Don't you care about my pain? Wave after wave is crashing in and you can't breathe. And you're like, Jesus, will you just give me a break? Just a slight relief to help me catch my breath. If you loved us, the disciples were saying, you wouldn't let this happen to us. If you loved us, they were saying, you would put a stop to this. You wouldn't be putting us in this kind of danger. If you loved us, you wouldn't be exposing us to this kind of pain. And so we ask the same questions, don't we? God, if you love me, if you care about me, why are you letting me drown? Why are you letting me go through this? And notice 
when the storm came upon the disciples. When did it come? Verse 23, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. His disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. The storm came while the disciples were following Jesus. Remember what happened last week? The scribe saying with wrong motives, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Another disciple saying, Jesus, I want to follow you, but first let me go do this other thing. So Jesus' disciples here, they're described in contrast to the other guys that we just saw last week. These disciples were actually following Jesus, and yet the storm came. And so what is Jesus teaching us here? that we shouldn't ever think that just because we're following Jesus that we'll be exempt from the storms of life. That storms in and of themselves don't tell you whether you're in or out of God's will or not. Sometimes because you're not in a storm, sometimes because things are pretty good, you think, therefore, you're doing pretty good, right? But that's not always the case. What we're seeing here is that you may very well be following and obeying Jesus, but still the storms come. But not only that, that in the midst of the storms, I wonder if you could relate with the disciples here. Things are so bad, things are so crazy that they literally think they're going to die. And they look over at Jesus, the only one that could possibly do anything about this, and what's he doing? And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. But he was asleep. So can you imagine what the disciples are going through here? What in the world, Jesus? You're sleeping? We're about to die and you're sleeping? What good is a savior if he's asleep when you need saving, right? First of all, why was he sleeping? Why was Jesus sleeping? Because in his humanity, he was exhausted. And isn't it incredible? How tired would you have to be to be sleeping through a storm so great that the only language that the biblical authors could put to it was that it was seismos, that it was an earthquake storm? What we're seeing here is that the God of the universe came down, and not only did he die for you, but he got tired for you. Not only did he die for you, but he got tired for you. He worked, and he worked so hard. He served, and he served, and he poured himself out to the point that not even an earthquake storm could awaken him. If the question was ever, Jesus, don't you care, seeing him there sleeping, completely exhausted, completely emptied for us should have answered that question, right? But the disciples conclude something different. They conclude that Jesus is sleeping because he doesn't care, because he's indifferent to their troubles. But Jesus' sleeping is not a display of his indifference. In his human nature, he was sleeping because he was tired. But in his divine nature, it was a demonstration of his complete sovereignty and control. Jesus was sleeping because he wasn't alarmed. Jesus was sleeping because he wasn't panicking. Jesus was sleeping because he was in complete and absolute control. Jesus was in complete control, and so his disciples shouldn't have been scared. They shouldn't have been worrying. I've shared this story before, but I want to share it with you again. It's about the time in my life when I experienced like, some of the greatest worries of my life, some of the greatest panics of my life. Um, in hindsight, it's kind of comical, but in the moment, I was panicking. It was about, it's about the time when I experienced the miracle of birth, for our firstborn, Malachi, should be called the horror of birth, right? There's just some things that happen in that delivery room. It's just not okay. It's not okay. <laughs> if in any other scenario, your kid would come in, and it's purple, covered in what looks like cottage cheese, and it's gagging and crying, like you'd be freaking out, right? And so we're in here, and, and my wife, Angela, she's screaming. She's like, going through crazy stuff I can't even imagine, and the doctor says, okay, I want you to come here, and I'm like, I'm ready. Tell me what to do. I'll do anything. He says, I want you to stand here and hold her knee. I'm like, what? Just hold, stand here, hold her knee. And so my wife is in so much pain, screaming, I think she's going to die. My firstborn son is about to pop out into the universe any second. I'm just standing there holding her knee, you know? <laughs> and so I'm not in control over this thing. And then I hear the nurse say, we see the head. I'm like, you see the head? I got to look, right? 
I shouldn't have looked. <laughs> Should not have looked. So what I see is the very top portion of Malachi's head coming out. And what I didn't know at the time was that babies are these real squishy, moldable, bendable creatures that Malachi's head's like this big, but it's squeezing through some spaces, you know? And it's just squeezing, and the top of his head should look like this, but it looks like this, okay? And so I come to the only natural conclusion I could come to, which was, oh no, I'm having a mini baby. I'm having a mini baby. And so I'm, I'm panicking, I'm going crazy, but I'm trying to stay calm for Angela. I'm just like, I'm having a mini baby, but it's okay. I'm gonna love him, I'm gonna teach him football. Like, and there's only one thing that calms me down in the midst of this scene out of Alien, and it's the doctor's face. The doctor's face, completely calm. He's like, da da da, like almost bored, right? <laughs> and so, and so he, the man that was in charge, wasn't worried, and so I didn't need to be worried either. And so what's my point? My point is that Jesus, the creator of the universe, was in the boat with them, and he was sleeping. He was perfectly calm, and so the disciples shouldn't have been scared. If you rem remember one thing, remember this, that no matter what the storm you're going through today or will ever go through, Jesus is in the boat with you. He's in the boat with you right now, no matter what you're going through, no matter how horrific it is, no matter how crazy you think it is, Jesus is with you. He's in the boat with you, and he's completely in control. He's completely calm. Just look at his face and be calmed by it. Christian, you may not be exempt from the storms of life, but here's what you do get. Jesus never promised no storms for you. He just promises that he'll be with you in the storm. Jesus never said, I'll keep you from all the storms of life. He just says, no matter what, no matter what you're going through, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll be right there. And so the storm, as violent as it was, didn't awake Jesus, but what did awake Jesus? The cries of his disciples, the cries of those whom he deeply loved. Jesus could sleep through the storm, but he couldn't sleep through their cries. And that's a very, very comforting thing to know. You see, a storm is of no consequence to your Savior. In a sense, he'll just sleep right through it. But the moment we, in our worry and panic, the moment we, in our weakness and fear and faithlessness, we cry out to him, he immediately pays attention and he responds. And so in the midst of your storm, don't forget to cry out to Jesus. Crying out to Jesus was the one thing that the disciples got right in the story. Even if all you can get out is, Jesus, don't you care? Even if all you can get out is, Jesus, don't you care that I'm dying here? We don't have to get it all right for Jesus to come to help us. That's the amazing thing about Jesus. And so what happens next? Matthew tells us that Jesus woke up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And how did Jesus still the storm? With his word. He simply said, peace, be still. That's all. It was a command of utter simplicity. Jesus didn't brace himself. He didn't roll up his sleeves. He didn't raise a magic wand or conjure up some power through some incantation. There was no expecto patronum in there. He simply spoke. And the wind and the waves obeyed his voice. They completely obeyed. Matthew tells us that the wind ceased and there was a great calm. It could be literally translated a dead calm. If you've ever lived near the ocean, even after a hurricane has passed, right? For hours, waves upon waves after waves crashing in, right? But Matthew tells us that in this earthquake of a storm, this earthquake of a storm obeyed Jesus to the point that immediately, not gradually, but immediately a churning sea became still like a sheet of glass. We human beings are the only ones in all of creation that think obeying Jesus is optional, that obeying Jesus can be put off, delayed. The wind and the seas obey him. They obey him immediately. All sickness and disease obey him immediately and completely. And even the demons are so terrified of him, they obey his every command. But something about the heart of man, 
something about our hearts. But as evil and weak and unbelieving as we can be, when we cry out to him, he still hears. And that's the real wonder of this story. That's the real miracle in this story. In a sense, don't get distracted by Jesus calming the storm. That's easy for him. That's real easy for him. But you know what cost him everything? What cost him everything is to be with us. Not just in the midst of the storm, but in the midst of our unbelief. In the midst of our faithlessness. He's, his willingness to endure us as ugly as we may be when crying out to Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? Yes, he cares. Do you see what he's doing here? But we're so tempted to stop here and say, see, Jesus does care about his disciples because, because he calmed the storm. That's proof that Jesus cares for us, right? No, we can't stop here because that would be a scary conclusion to come to because sometimes Jesus doesn't calm the storm. Right? Sometimes he doesn't calm the storm, at least not immediately. Sometimes the storm that we face will face until the day that we die. That's when he'll calm it. So instead, what this text is showing us is that Jesus proves that he cares for us, that he cares for his disciples, not primarily because he calmed the storm, but primarily because he brought the storm. After all, the wind and the waves, they obey him, right? They come and go with his divine permission. The storm came and the disciples were deathly afraid and they cry and they awake Jesus. But Matthew tells us that before addressing the storm, he addressed the disciples. That before addressing the storm, he addresses their faith. Verse 25, and they went and woke him saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then... Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Before he stills the storm, Jesus asks, why are you so afraid, are you of little faith? That's critical. If the storm was the primary issue, he would have calmed the storm first, right? But the storm was just the tool to address the primary issue, which was what? Their faith. More precisely, their faithlessness. Because here's the remarkable thing about the storm. The storm didn't produce faithlessness in the disciples, right? It revealed the faithlessness that was already there. And so do you see Jesus' care for his disciples in bringing the storm and Jesus' care for us when he brings storms into our lives? Storms come our way and we start to question God's love for us. Storms come our way and we start to question God's care for us. It makes us doubt God's goodness. It proves us faithless. But did the storm produce our faithlessness? Did the storm produce these questions and doubts? No, it just revealed them. When I get hungry and I start acting like a jerk to Angela, being hungry didn't make me into a jerk. It just shows that I'm already a jerk, right? Storms reveal what's already there. Deep in our hearts, it may have settled down deep and lies hidden under the sand, under the facade that we put on, but the storm churns it up and reveals what's deep in our hearts. Apart from the storm, we'd never see the lack of faith, the lack of trust, all the doubts that lie dormant in our hearts. Do you see the need for the storm in our hearts? Because you see, when everything is going right and prosperity and comfort abounds, every, the, you're healthy and everybody you know and love is healthy and strong and all the bills are paid and you're getting raises and your grades are amazing and you're crushing it. In those times, there's really no way to know whether you really trust Jesus, is there? But when darkness comes and everything seems to be going wrong, that's when you really find out whether you trust Jesus or not. And so Jesus uses the storm to point out the real problem. Jesus uses the outer physical storm to point to the inner storm of the heart that can truly cause us to sink. A storm may cause them to physically perish, but unbelief will cause them to eternally perish. Faithlessness and unbelief are the things that can really cause us to sink and perish, and that's why Jesus brings the storm. 
And that's why Jesus has to reveal these things through the storm. And so the real fight in the midst of the storm isn't trying to figure out how to get rid of the storm. That's where we spend most of our time and energy, right? How can I deal with this thing? How can I get this thing rid of, uh, of my life, get it out? How do I be done with it? The storm being stilled is a blessing that will come in due time after the storm has fully served God's purpose. But the real fight is the fight not to lose faith. And a quick word about warn, uh, word, word of warning here. There's so much junk being taught when it comes to faith, isn't there? One of the most popular being that we need to show our faith by speaking our faith over our storms, right? Just claim your victory, speak your faith over the storm. But what is God's word showing us here? Show your faith, not by speaking to the storm, but by speaking to your savior in the midst of the storm. He's the only one who has the power to speak to the storm. Like, what are you gonna do? Speak to your storm. What? And, right? Jesus is the only one who has the power. Our faith is demonstrated when we pray to him and trust him in the midst of it. That's the fight for faith. And that's the divine intended purpose of the storm, to increase our faith in him. For the believer, every storm has a purpose. There's not a wasted storm for the believer. Whatever you're going through, Every storm has a divine intended purpose in your life. They have one main purpose, and that is to give you a bigger view of Jesus. Bigger view. Because look at what the disciples say after Jesus leads them through the storm. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm, and the men marveled. What's their response? And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Matthew tells us that the disciples marveled. They were marveling because the storm helped them see and experience Jesus in a way that they never had before. They're like, we thought we knew who this man was, but no, we're wrong. He's more than we thought. He's greater than we thought. He's better than we thought. What sort of man is this? They're saying this Jesus doesn't fit into any of our categories. They're saying we have a category for God who could command the sea and the waves. And we have a category for man that can be near and sit with us in the storm. But we don't have a category for someone who commands storms and sits with us in the midst of it. They were looking at this person who because he's human, he has to go to sleep because he's tired, but when he wakes up, he puts the storm to sleep because he's God. They marveled at him. What sort of man is this? What sort of man is this that he sits with you and is able to sympathize with your weakness and he's able to say, I know what you're going through. I know your pain. I've experienced it. But at the same time, He has the power to do something about it. He has the power to calm your fears. He has the power to comfort us in our pain. What sort of man is this? God used the storm to give his disciples a greater view of Jesus. How's your view of Jesus today? How's your view of Jesus today? Perhaps really high. It's because of your high view of Jesus that sometimes you get so desperate. It's the reason why you get so frustrated and angry at him. If your view of Jesus was low and you didn't think he had anything to do with your problems, if you didn't think he could do anything about your problems, why would you get angry at him? But you're getting angry at him because you know he has the power. You're saying, Jesus, you could have stopped it, right? You're saying, Jesus, you had the power to stop this terrible thing from happening in the first place, and even right now, you have the power to make it all go away, and so why aren't you, Jesus? Your view of Jesus is high, but here's the thing. You have the faith to believe that he can stop the storm, but do you have the faith to believe that he's using the storm for your good, that the storm is just a servant of his, just a tool, and he's doing something in you, Do you believe that Jesus is more powerful than you to stop the storm, but do you believe that he's at the same time wiser than you to have a reason and a divine purpose for the storm that you're just not wise enough to see right now? 
God is always doing 10,000 things through the storms in our lives, but one of the primary things that he's always doing is through the storm, he's giving you a greater view of Jesus so that on the other side, you're able to say, I thought I knew him, but he's better than that. I thought I knew him, but he's greater than that. It's like Job when he said, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you, right? In the midst of all of his comfort, in the midst of all his prosperity, he's saying, my knowing you is equivalent to hearing of you. But after all the suffering, after all the storms, he says, but now my eyes see you. And some of you can testify to that. In closing, in light of this precious story, in light of these precious truths, that no matter what the storm, Jesus promises to be with you in the storm. That's the first truth. Remember it. No matter what the storm you're going through, Jesus promises to never leave you, never forsake you. He's with you in it. And that the storm always has a divine purpose to give you a greater view of Jesus so that you will know him and experience him in a way that you had never had before. In light of these truths, what does responding in great faith look like in the midst of the storm? Matthew chapter 8 is an example of Jesus kindly responding to the littleness of the faith of his disciples, right? But what does responding in great faith look like in the midst of our storms? I think one of the greatest examples of it is in Daniel chapter three. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace for refusing to bow down to other gods, refusing to worship the gods of Babylon. They were given one last chance by King Nebuchadnezzar to recant and bow down, but this was their answer. They say in verse 16, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, if you're going to throw us into the fiery furnace, we have no need to answer you in this matter, right? In other words, what? We got nothing to say. There's no crying out to God with great injustice. God, we're just trying to follow you. We're just trying to obey you, and this is what we get? There are no great accusations made. God, don't you care that we're perishing? And look at verse 17. And they say, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. That sounds like great faith, right? And that is great faith. But it's not as great as it's going to be. Their next three words are what makes up true great faith. They say, but if not. But if not is the key. But if not, is the expression of truly great faith. In other words, our God is able to. We trust that he has the power to, but if not. You know, sometimes as Christians, we say, but if not. But it's really because we don't believe he has the power. We ask for things and we say, but if not, if it's not your will, we trust you. Right? It's because we don't really trust he has the power to. We say, but if not, oftentimes because we're trying to guard ourselves and protect our hearts from being hurt when we ask God for something and he doesn't come through. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they hold on to the greatness of their faith and trusting God's power. God, you're able to, and we believe you will. And, but at the same time, we also trust in your wisdom to do what's best. God, we trust your power. We trust your wisdom. We just trust you. That's great faith. We just trust you, right? But here's my favorite part. Three were thrown in, but when King Nebuchadnezzar looked in, how many were there? There was four, verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Three were thrown in, but there was another in the fire with them. And we all know who that is. This is the unshakable promise that we have in Jesus. You ready? That no matter the quality of your faith, whether it's little like the disciples in the storm, 
or whether it's great like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, what's constant? Jesus being there. Jesus being there. Sometimes our faith it feels so little. And sometimes, by God's grace, it feels strong. But Jesus' promise to you is, no matter what, no matter the quality of your faith, no matter how you're doing in the moment, whether you're weak or whether you're strong, I'll be there. What sort of man is this that refuses to let you go? What sort of man is this who's enduringly strong? What sort of man is this that's so faithful even when we're absolutely faithless? His name is Jesus. There's none like him. He's with you in the storm. He's with you in the fire. He's able to bear the full weight of all of your trust, all of your faith. We can trust him. Church, whatever you're going through, He's with you, and you can trust him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your power, that you are able to deliver us, and you will deliver us from whatever storms of life. And we thank you for your wisdom that does things, that chooses things that we would never choose for ourselves. And yet you choose it because you know what's best. Because through the storms in our lives, you are giving us a greater view of Jesus. Through the storms in our lives, you are allowing us to see parts and aspects of Jesus that we would have never seen for ourselves. And so, Father... In trembling, we pray, whatever the storm, if it means we get more of Jesus, bring it on, storm. We want Jesus. We want more of Jesus. Nothing less than Jesus will do. Nothing in this world can comfort us like Jesus can. Nothing can satisfy our hearts like Jesus can. He is our prize. He is our treasure. Thank you for his nearness. Thank you for his promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.